We are joined today by Joe Haldeman, who is a Vietnam veteran and a science fiction writer whose best known work may be The Forever War. His newest novel is Work Done for Hire. And as some of our viewers may recall, I've recommended both The Forever War and Forever Peace to you. Uh, Joe, it's such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for doing this. Always glad to do it. Thanks. So let's talk a little bit first about uh, the Forever War because this was the first book you you uh, I read of yours. Uh, it's from the 1970s. How direct and overt were the kind of allusions to the Vietnam War that may come from your personal history uh, in that book? Was that deliberate or was it more of just the natural way that it went? I would lean toward uh, natural rather than deliberate. I mean, it was the war that I was in, so of course it provides a lot of the angles and details and so forth. And when you when you think about the term forever war, um, in the book, of course, the reason that the war goes on for so long is related to the kind of logistics of time travel and time dilation. But was that the way it felt with the Vietnam War as someone who who was in the nitty gritty of what was going on? I'd have to say that it wasn't really like that. Uh, I felt as if the war wasn't going on forever, but the people who weren't involved in the war didn't seem to worry much about it. And, you know, those of us who were fighting or recovering from it, it was the central fact of our existence. And yet America didn't seem to think it was that important at the time. Is that the way it felt? In other words, uh, we've heard this from others. We even we've, we've even heard from people like John Kerry who have talked about what it felt like uh, the perception was from those who were stateside. You felt as though it just wasn't really being paid attention to by the by mainstream America. Well, in fact, the attention was mostly of a negative kind, mm. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> partly it's uh, baby killer kind of uh, exaggeration and and the definite division in the United States between people who are in favor of the war and people who are both against the war and against any war, uh, including yours truly. I mean, I was drafted against my will and went off to fight somebody else's war. Hmm. When you put together, uh, uh, when you start working on a book like The Forever War or Forever Peace, when I've spoken to nonfiction authors, they're very, very clear that they have the full story. They have essentially a fully formed outline or skeleton of what their their book will be before they even start writing. Does it work that way with this genre that you write in or is it a very different type of process? For me, it's different. I, I do know writers of fiction who outline to a fairly well, you know, they might have 50 pages of outline before they start writing. For myself, I like to get the writing going and let the story generate itself as it grows. Uh, there are all kinds of ways to write a novel, and that's only one. That's the one that works for me. Are the kind of tech elements and futuristic technologies and the like, are those often the catalyst for the story, or do you kind of conceive the story first and then you flesh out the sci-fi elements that are a part of it? Well, I've gone both way, ways, actually. The one I'm doing uh, now, Phobos Means Fear, actually came from an article in New Scientist, uh, a little article, about six column inches. And I thought, holy cow, I've got to use that. <laughs> and I sat down to write the book. But uh, more often it's the other way around. And where, where do you find that your ideas about these hypothetical technologies come from? In other words, are they, are they rooted maybe in, in an actual science article you may have read, or do you feel that you kind of conceive them from the ground up? Well, I guess you'd have to say they're rooted in my background. My education is in science rather than uh, literature. And, you know, I, I see the world as a scientist does, I think, an objective kind of way. Uh, so my stories are colored by that viewpoint. As I told my audience earlier on today's program, I recently finished reading Forever Peace, and that's a book that was written sometime before drone warfare, as we now are, are very aware of it, if we're paying attention to the news is being described to us. When you wrote that, uh, I guess I, I'm not even sure how to ask this question. When you now hear about what's going on with drone warfare, and I don't want to give too much away about the book for people who haven't read it, 
Did you have that in mind? Are you surprised by the way drone warfare has now become so prevalent? I was a little surprised at how accurate my predictions were. Hmm. I mean, I'm a science fiction writer. I don't write as a prophet. You know, if that future I described had not come to pass, it would still be a valid view of the future. I mean, it's a matter of dumb luck, actually. <laughs> I, I seem to have uh, proje predicted how the future was going to come about, but I really didn't expect that while I was writing it. I was just writing a story, and it needed drone warfare, which didn't have a name at the time, I don't think. It's very interesting to me that one of the main issues that now is being discussed around drone warfare is this disconnection from the operator of the drone to the reality on the ground. And through through imaginary technological means in forever peace, you at least to some extent, maybe not to the plight of the victims, but at least to the idea of being there, you figured out a way to connect the, the drone operator, the machine operator to what's going on on the ground. When you think about modern drone warfare, is, is that a concern to you, this idea that there's this physical disconnection that may make these, these uh, uh, incursions almost video game-like? Well, there's an element of that, of course. Now, when I was an engineer attached to the infantry in Vietnam, my main weapon was a radio, a radio telephone with which I could call in airstrikes and artillery support. Mm. Because I was in a very small unit, just sort of wandering around in the jungle, the woods in our case, and drawing fire from the enemy. And our main weapon was the radio telephone. Uh, so in that way, of course, it's a little bit futuristic. Although, to be honest, uh, I first ran into it uh, in records of uh, World War II. So it was old when I was born, actually. When you think about uh, your, your early writing, when you go back and pick up and maybe I don't know if you even do this, but if you are to kind of page through the forever war, uh, are you still satisfied with it? Do you what are your reactions to your earlier work? And, you know, when, when I go back and look at a program I did only five years ago, um, I'm incredibly self-critical of what was going on. Either I didn't make the point the way I wanted to or I missed key details or whatever the case may be. What's it like to go back and look at something you wrote uh, 30 years ago? You know, for one thing, you have to. I'm I'm charitable with other writers. When I read <laughs> somebody else's work, I say, "Okay, he's doing the best he can." Right. Well, I, that's the way I look at my old work. I would write it much differently now. Of course, I would. I hope I've continued learning about writing. But in fact, that guy, that guy was writing forty years ago. What could he know about what is the rather distant future now? Uh, as I say, I have sympathy for the one I, the person I was forty years ago. But we don't feel the same way about many things. That's fair. Maybe when I look back at my old shows, I should just say, that's the best I could do at the time with the that's experience right. and the skills that I had. That's exactly it. In fact, trying to evaluate your own creativity is kind of a fool's game anyhow. Because basically, your success is not based on your evaluation of it. It's based on the other people, the people who pay to read or watch your stuff. So, you know, you do the best you can. Then you move on and do something else the next day. For our television and radio audience, we will pause there and go to a break. We will stay with Joe Haldeman and we will have more of the complete interview on our YouTube channel. Uh, to talk for a second about not so much being charitable or not or criticizing your past work, but in looking at your writing style, uh, one of my favorite authors is John Le Carre, and one of his earlier works is The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, and that's a, a, almost a 50-year-old book at this point. Wow. And, he, and he and he's written a book every couple of years for more or less the last 40 or 50 years. And while the themes of his writing have changed significantly, going from the Cold War to kind of more modern, uh, maybe uh, 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 radical Islam, etc., I can't really identify significant ways in which his style has changed over a pretty long period of time. Do you think your style of writing has changed over the last 40 years? I know it has. I'm a, I have been a writing teacher as well as a writer, and I can be a little bit objective about my own production. And I can tell I made mistakes 40 years ago that I would not make now. Now, I'm making mistakes now that I don't see. I know that's true. It's true of every writer. But they're not the same ones. 
I have watched the sort of reaction to my work, and I've I've taken some. Uh, yeah, I don't like being criticized. Nobody does, but I listen to it, and I try to improve my current writing from uh, the comments other people made for from my earlier work. Are there particular uh, science fiction writers that you either read or followed or, or not necessarily modeled your work after, but who was it that you really liked reading? When I was a kid, I really loved Robert Heinlein. And, uh, oh, let me see, James Blish and uh, Alfred Bester was a big one. Arthur Clarke, of course, Harry Harrison, Isaac Asimov, all the old guys. You know, when I was a kid, I ate them up. And I suppose the reason I don't eat them up now is I guess I've become too uh, overexposed and too sophisticated. I do read some science fiction every now and then, but I don't try to keep up with it. I mean, a thousand books a year, Jesus, you wouldn't be able to do anything else if you kept up with it. That's interesting. You know, I talk to a lot of people who, who seem to not, whether it's television, radio or books, they don't follow their particular genre or area very closely. And I find this even applying to me. In other words, the, the reading I do to prepare for my program, which is mostly news and politics, of course, relates to that. But my personal reading, so to speak, has very little to do. I wonder if there's something about um, uh, 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 thinking about or putting energy into areas that are unrelated from your work that in some way kind of helps you within your own field. Well, I do think it helps me. I, I have seen in other people's writing uh, a kind of a mutual appreciation society. I see people uh, who are influenced by the same people who influenced me, so I can't claim to be <laughs> somehow immune to this. But I, I think that uh, you should watch it. You should watch for repetition in your work. You should watch for influences that maybe we're better left with the previous artist. Uh, I don't know. The thing is, trying to talk, talking about your own writing is, is foolish and, uh, and dangerous, of course. Talking about other people's writing can be even worse because people might suspect your motives. <laughs> Say, oh, <laughs> he's getting paid too much. <laughs> don't read him. Yeah. I have one question that I came up with uh, when reading Forever Peace, which is in the book, you mention a character reading The Long Goodbye by Raymond Chandler. And that Raymond Chandler is one of my favorite authors and The Long Goodbye uh, among his work, one of my favorite books. Was that of particular significance to you or was there any hidden meaning to one of your characters reading that book? You know, the hidden meaning is not hidden at all to me because I happened to read that novel while I was writing the book. Mm. And so I just put it in there. <laughs> uh, he's a great model, of course, for anybody who writes masculine fiction, uh, not, just, uh, not just genre fiction. So, yeah, my, my printer is making strange noises. Are you picking them up? No, and I, I assure you I'm not controlling it in any way, so it's, okay. not, uh, it's not me by any means. I think it's coming from my wife's computer about... 200 yards away. <laughs> so, Joe, last thing I want to touch on is are, are, you mentioned what you're working on now. Your latest work is Work Done for Hire. Can you tell us anything about what you're working on today? Well, what I'm working on today is a novel called Phobos Means Fear. And it's a hard SF novel, hard science fiction. That is to say, the level of science in it is, is pretty high. The main character is a scientist. And she's going through a sort of... Uh, late midlife crisis. She's uh, in her 60s and does feel uh, somewhat estranged from younger scientists. So in, in a way, it's kind of autobiographical. I think most novelists can't get away from that trap. Are there ever days where you just don't feel like writing at all? Very rarely. You know, in, in fact, it's quite the contrary. I, I don't enjoy writing every day. But I certainly don't like days when I don't write. Hmm. When I'm on vacation and supposed to be having fun, I'm going, yeah, where's my word processor? <laughs> I sure I'm supposed to be doing something here. No question. Uh, we've been speaking with Vietnam veteran Joe Haldeman, science fiction writer, The Forever War, Forever Peace. The newest novel is Work Done for Hire. 
Joe, really a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you for having me, David.